Um, I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of August 6, 2024. Uh, today is the beginning of the hospital budget sorry, review sorry. session. This is the court reporter. Are you ready to go on the record? Oh, sorry. Yes. Can we go on the record, please? One sec. We are now on a record. Thank you. Um, I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of August 6, 2024. Today begins the hospital budget review session. Um, we have an overview of the 20 fiscal year 25 hospital budget request from the director of health systems, finances and policy by uh, Elena Barabee. And then we have insights being presented by Tom Reese relating to certain Vermont hospital financials. Um, first, I'll turn to the meeting minutes from July 10th and I will move for approval of the meeting minutes from July 10th. Second. All in favor of approval, say aye. 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 And the meeting minutes are approved. And I'll turn to Susan Barrett for the executive director's report. Good morning, Chair Foster. Uh, we have several open public comment periods. The first is related to, to, to today's discussion, and that is the FY25 hospital budget. The, that uh, public comment period open today, and we'll be taking public comments through August 30th, noon at, um, on August 30th. I do want to say we take public comments at any time, um, but this is a special public comment period for the FY25 hospital budget. In addition, we're accepting public comments for the second phase of the community engagement regarding hospital sustainability. Uh, we've received uh, many, many comments. Please keep them coming. They are informing our contractor, uh, Dr. Hamery and Oliver Winan as they finalize their report on hospital sustainability. And I just wanted to put in a plug for a meeting that we had last night, which was virtual and uh, folks can look at that. And if you're not talking, could you mute? Thank you. Um, on our YouTube channel, uh, please check that out. It was a really robust conversation. It was the overview of a, a statewide um, presentation by Dr. Hamry and Oliver Wynan on hospital sustainability. Um, any of those public comments that we, we receive on Act 167 and hospital sustainability we are sharing with the Agency of Human Services as they are leading the, trans, uh, the transformation on this project. So please keep them coming. And then last but not least, we are accepting public comments on a next all-payer model, a potential next all-payer model um, as uh, we work through those negotiations, please keep those public comments coming. And we also share those comments with the Agency of Human Services as they are leading the negotiation on the ahead potential ahead model. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I have nothing else other than to turn to Ms. Barabee for her presentation and overview of the budgets. Great, thank you. All right, I will share my screen. <clears throat> Let me know. If you can see it, good. Okay. Um, and I will be joined um, by Mark Hengsler, who is um, one of our staff attorneys um, when we get to the kind of the statute and rule background. So I just wanted to say that. Um, so we'll I'll go through a brief background. I'll turn it over to Mark, then we'll kind of do a brief reminder of what we established in guidance earlier this year. Um, and then I'll run through a summary of hospital budget requests. Um, and then we can talk about next steps. Um, so some background information, I'm gonna breeze through these. You've probably seen these um, in various uh, forms uh, many times, but just as a reminder for folks who are joining us for the first time, um, Vermont um, has one of the highest spending per capita um, among 
all states in the country. And we know that our country as a whole um, is doing pretty uh, poorly in terms of how it's controlling its healthcare spending um, compared to many peer countries. Um, in the 1990s, we were kind of among the lowest spenders per capita. Um, and this has dramatically increased um, in more recent years, um, really starting after 2010, we've kind of hung out at the top decile rankings amongst all states. Um, and as you know, one thing is if you look regionally, New England is one of the higher regions um, for healthcare spending per capita, but Vermont remains kind of among the highest, um, even compared to our peers, only surpassed by Massachusetts, which is also known for um, its high spending. Um, and this is translating into higher premiums and is creating real affordability challenges. I think this is a slide we're all familiar with, particularly in right light of recent discussions. Um, we're seeing higher than national average growth. Um, we're already higher, and that might be well and good. We're providing you know, uh, better benefits um, than some other states, but our growth um, is really astronomical compared to um, comparable states. Um, if you look from 2019 to 2024, compared to other New England states, uh, Vermont has had the highest growth um, in premiums over that period of time. Um, and some may say that age um, has a lot to do with this growth factor, but what we see is Vermont is kind of middle of the road compared to our New England peers. Um, and so age alone does not explain this trend. Um, there's something else kind of going on. Um, it's not all just the QHP market. It's also in employer-based insurance um, premiums. We're seeing similar growth. Uh, unfortunately, this stops at 2022. We know there were some substantial growth since then. So this probably is only going to look worse. Um, you know, to date, there's been kind of limited um, transferring of that premium to the employee. Employers have been bearing the brunt, but, you know, there's probably limited returns there. And, and they're also foregoing kind of wage growth and other things that we've heard anecdotally are happening as a result of this healthcare spending growth. Um, as you know, you know, this has not looked good over the course of um, you know, recent years. And so growth is is really is is big right now. And, and um, we have some decisions to be made um, about where we go next. Um, Hospital spending is a major component. So at national level, where um, you know around a third of spending is really on hospital care. Um, this is one area that we look to control spending growth. Um, in Vermont, it's much higher than than our than many other um, states. Um, you know, around half. This isn't kind of apples to apples, but it is. There is kind of a spread that is um, interesting to look at. Sorry, Miss um, Miss Barbie, can I can yeah. I interrupt for just a, a minute? I got a sure. a note. Um, Miss Barrett, are there people in another link? Yes, I got a call from someone where there's um an, a faulty link. So the correct link is on the monthly meeting agenda. I can work with Kristen to correct that if we can just pause. There's quite a large group in another meeting. Okay. Okay, we should probably address sorry. that. Why don't we? Yeah. Why don't we just take? Um, I'm sorry, Elena. Um, mm -hmm, why don't we just? Fine. We'll take a break for ten minutes and come back to this link, Susan. Okay, that's so we'll resume at, at at nine twenty. Susan, did everything get worked out? Yes, it did. Thank you. I apologize for the delay. No problem. <clears throat> um, and Maggie, are you here? Yes, I am. Great. Okay. We'll go back on the record and resume. So thank go you for the. the Great. Thank you. So I should pick up where we left off. Um, so we we're talking about how hospital spending um, is a major driver of um, healthcare spending. And in our state, we spend um, almost half <clears throat> of our healthcare expenditures on hospital care. Um, and one reason for this could be that we have really great access or we're using a lot of services. Um, when you look at the Dartmouth Atlas data, that doesn't appear to be the case. Um, this uses Medicare claims to look at volume of service delivery and um, intensity of service delivery. And there's a usually a high correlation between volume in one payer and volume in another payer, just in terms of provider trends um, and organizational trends. Um, and so there is quite a, um, so it's not, you know, 
exact, um, it doesn't have all payer, but it's a really good indicator of um, of service use. And what we see is when we look at hospital admissions um, during the last six months of life, um, Vermont is one of the lower states. When we look at price adjusted total Medicare reimbursement, so that's kind of total volume of services, we're also among um, the states with lowest volume. Um, when you look at uh, cost report data and you look at adjusted patient discharges, so this is a measure of inpatient outpatient volume that's supposed to get kind of more apples to apples across hospitals. Um, our utilization has looked relatively flat and quite low compared to other states, um, particularly this is looking at New England states. Um, when we look at the um, NASHB cost tool, again, um, you can kind of see over time, um, you know, we're kind of on the lower end, we're a smaller states, so that makes sense. Um, but our growth um, has been, you know, pretty flat, um, similar to other states with with the exception of 2020 when there was a dip for all, um, really most states. Um, and then if we look at hospital emissions per 1,000, again, we're on the lower end. Um, so we're just kind of triangulating lots of different ways of looking at the data and there's kind of consistently on the lower end of um, utilization. <clears throat> we look at BUDS data. So this is the hospital discharge data that the state maintains. And um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get newer data, but you know it's been pretty flat um, since 2017 to 2021. It'd be great to see these data um, updated as we move forward and kind of tracking um, um, visits and discharges over time. Um, so you know when we look at the volume data, not a lot um, of rationale for a higher um, higher spending. When we look at operating expense growth per adjusted discharge, Vermont is among the highest compared to New England peers, um, only second to, um, in this case, Maine. Um, this is looking using NASHP hospital cost tool data um, and looking at operating expenditures at the state level per the state level adjusted discharge. This is effectively kind of like a state average. It's not a hospital median. It's really looking at all the, <clears throat> all the volume across the state. Um, and so you can see from 2012 to 2022, we're you know right there with the highest level of growth um, in terms of costs. Um, and these costs translate into higher prices. And I'll not go too deep here because we'll have a presentation this afternoon from the folks that um, pulled these data together. Um, and Rand is going to speak with us about the latest um, uh, pricing analysis. But what you can see is Vermont is um, tends to be kind of at the higher end um, in terms of its prices per service. So this um, increasing operating expenditures kind of translates into higher prices. When we kind of dig in a little bit, um, this is looking over time for some of our um, academic medical centers serving our state versus our independent critical access. We kind of lump them together to look at um, averages. So this is looking at relative prices compared to Medicare. So what is your commercial price relative to a Medicare price as well as a standard price? So um, what is your kind of average adjusted price per service? Um, this is looking at inpatient services. And what you'll see is our critical access hospitals tend to be um, a little bit on the cheaper end, uh, while our academic medical center um, tends to be on the more expensive end. Um, Dartmouth-Hitchcock is another academic medical center, and they <clears throat> seem to be more affordable on these statistics compared to UVM. Um, Rotland is kind of on the cheaper end as well, um, or more in between Dartmouth and UVM. Southwestern Vermont is also um, kind of on the higher end, but yeah, so it just depends what year you're looking at. When we look at outpatient services, um, we see a similar phenomenon. Um, in critical access hospitals tend to be on the on the more affordable end, um, and our academic medical center tends to be quite expensive, um, almost in 2022, almost at 400% of Medicare. Um, so I want to talk about some other trends that are happening. Um, Medicare Advantage. Um, there's increased penetration um, in our market, um, as there are in many markets, and this affects how hospitals get reimbursed. Um, we're looking at public payer rates. Um, so Medicare will see a 2.9% rate increase. We're expecting in our PPS hospitals, critical access hospitals will continue to receive kind of a cost plus reimbursement. Um, Medicaid will have a 0%, we understand 0% increase this year in terms of reimbursement. Um, and we, 
you know, it's hard to kind of find the budgetary impact. So we have some questions out to hospitals on the impact of New York Medicaid rate increases, but they did increase their appropriations for hospitals. So we would expect to see some increase there. I'm just not sure how much. So, you know, there's not huge reimbursement increases from our payers. Um, we know that Medicare Advantage um, is really kind of more along the lines of a capitated payment and don't always um, pay super well. Um, we're going to continue to have labor expense growth. Um, so, you know, there's no end in sight in terms of operating expense growth, and we'll kind of look into the um, into the details soon. Um, pharmaceutical spending um, is expected to continue to grow um, into the near future, you know, from four to seven percent. Um, this is a national analysis um, put together by IQVIA, who kind of closely monitors pharmaceutical spending growth. Um, and so then while some protected brands the prices will decrease. Um, some of the um, list prices will continue to grow. So, you know, how this shakes out is, you know, consumers are going to continue to experience kind of the higher level of um, price increase. And then depending on how those reimbursements and discounts work, the um, those discounts will get spread out across the provider system. AI is another thing that, you know, we know that's being implemented. It affects the way care is delivered. It affects what care is delivered. You know, there's decision support tools, diagnostics, treatment recommendations. It affects kind of what services people um, are recommended and how we code acuity of patients. Um, and so, you know, well, this is another area to watch um, over time as, as that, as we learn more about how that is impacting healthcare spending and, and care delivery. Um, when you look at the Kaufman Hall National Hospital flash report, so this is really looking um, across, you know, across the nation, across regions, lot, you know, many different kinds of hospitals, for-profit, non-for-profit hospitals. Um, they kind of summarize some key takeaways. So June of this year, you know, things are looking definitely more stable than they have in the prior year. There's a growing divide between high-performing hospitals, those that kind of can manage cost growth, and low-performing hospitals, those that can't really manage cost growth um, or kind of struggling with volume. Um, 340B is another kind of area that um, continues to kind of expand, and some hospitals are taking advantage of those um, rebates. Um, uh, and I think those are the kind of key points. Um, I just want to point out, you know, we're not alone in being concerned about health spending, healthcare spending and healthcare spending growth. There are a lot of other states that are trying to um, kind of control healthcare spending. A lot of them start with kind of a to total cost of care growth target. Um, and some are getting more in the weeds on either reference-based pricing or hospital price caps. Um, hospital global budget, so other ways to kind of control um, and target hospital spending. And I believe um, Delaware just recently passed um, some legislation that would mirror some of our regulatory processes and hospital budget process. So there's kind of an uptick on, on interest and um, level of scrutiny on hospital spending. At the same time, I think, you know, this is not news to folks. We also struggle with um, kind of rural hospital financial health um, and the threat of rural hospital closures. Um, 192 rural hospitals have closed since 2005 across the country. So it's not just that, you know, our hospitals are super healthy and they're raking in the dough. There's also kind of this challenge of, um, you know, financial viability, particularly for some of our smaller hospitals. Um, and more than half of U.S. rural hospitals are at risk of closure when you kind of look at their operating margins. Um, so, again, we're not alone here, but we're definitely, if you kind of look across the country, we're in, in the middle to severe end of end of the spectrum. Um, so why is that the case? I'm not going to spend too much time, but just want to remind folks, you know, we have declining patient volume, higher costs associated with maintaining access to low volume services. It's really hard to get in economies of scale when you have rural populations. We want to make sure that we have care where we need it for everyone, regardless of where you live. Um, but we have to think about what the costs of maintaining those kinds of infrastructure are. Um, you know, inefficient operations or low provider productivity could also lead to um, struggling financial um, uh, position. So, um, you know, if you're not able to make, you know, serve patients and bring in reimbursements and maximize your provider time, um, that might um, lead to access challenges and uh, financial challenges if you don't have other ways of bringing in revenue. Um, administrative cost growth, so non-productive staff um, or 
staff that don't bring in revenue um, is also um, a challenge. Fixed costs that are too high given variable patient volume um, or unreimbursed borders and transfers that could be better served in other settings that aren't necessarily reimbursed within the hospital setting. So that's another um, kind of access driven challenge um, and could lead to financial challenges. Um, insufficient Medicaid reimbursement, assuming uh, services are delivered efficiently, you know, we may not be um, appropriately covering the cost of care delivery. Um, provider bypass. So sometimes we do have a hospital in our backyard. We could bring our, our health care dollars there, but we choose to drive further for care, um, either to a neighboring community or even out of state. And that brings um, spending, even though that spending still affects our premiums, it doesn't actually end up in our facilities in Vermont. Um, and then our rural healthcare workforce shortages and recruitment challenges often lead to a higher cost of labor. So um, you just having so many vacancies and so much competition can drive up um, labor spending and costs. Um, so I did, you know, I think uh, we started off with mentioning the community engagement work and all the great discussions that have been had. I mean, I think this is, I just want to highlight this work because hospital budget review process is one tool, but it's certainly, you know, the reason um, why we started this engagement work to begin with is because there are kind of limits to what we can do within this process if we're really going to solve this problem. So um, just recognizing that the decisions made here won't necessarily solve all of our challenges, but are trying to move us in, in a direction. So why should we regulate hospitals? Um, as we mentioned, higher hospital spending is a major contributor to unaffordable health insurance premiums and out-of-pocket costs. Um, this has real implications for Vermonters. Um, higher spending in one sector, uh, for example, hospital spending, could limit resources that could otherwise be allocated to other parts of the delivery system. We know that primary care, mental health, and other preventative um, services and social services are areas that are grossly underfunded and can have huge impacts and benefits for Vermonters. Um, we also know that spending money on healthcare limits spending that could be happening in other parts of the economy. Um, so, you know, financial um, uh, health debt and health burden kind of has ripple effects across our communities um, um, as well. Um, so Vermont's healthcare system is highly concentrated and there's not, you know, it's very localized as well. So um, regulation is essential to contain monopoly markets. And this is particularly salient in rural settings um, when we don't have as much competition. And it's not e as easy to get, you know, um, go to the other hospital down the street. It's kind of a bigger lift to kind of make it to somewhere else. And oftentimes you may not even have a choice, right? So you're going to go if you're in a, seeking out emergent services, you're going to kind of go where um, where you need to go when you need to go there. Um, so this our process has been around for a long time. I won't spend a lot of time here, but it has evolved. Um, um, but the main goal of constraining and um, kind of controlling healthcare cost growth has been at the forefront um, in maintaining, making sure we maintain access to care um, is another um, key objective. So I'm going to pass it over to Mark to take us through this next section, and then I'll pick it back up in a minute. Hey, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. I think that between Elena's engaging slides, I'm tasked with being the laborious middle, but uh, we're talking statute and rule. And, and really what I'm hoping to get across briefly here is the question of what is the board tasked with doing and then how is the board required to, to do that? You can go ahead to the next slide, Elena. So as a background, each year the board must establish a budget for each hospital by September 15th with a written decision by October 1st. When establishing a budget, the board relies on its statutory charge and the state's regulatory objectives. And what I'll do in a moment is, is just walk us through those so we're all on the same page about what the scaffolding is. In this process, hospitals bear the burden of, um, uh, well, if you pop back the other slide just for a moment, yeah, they, they bear the burden of persuasion in justifying their budgets as submitted. And if a hospital doesn't meet its burden of justifying its proposed budget, the board must adjust the budget so that it aligns with the state's regulatory objectives or regulatory goals. And go ahead to the, to the next slide. 
So when reviewing a hospital's budget, there are a few parts of statute that come into play. Um, first, there's the board's statutory purpose and charge. Second, the board's duty to regulate consistent with the principles for healthcare reform. Third, its obligation to establish budgets using considerations that are in the hospital budget review statute. And then fourth, annual benchmarks that the board establishes against which proposed budgets are initially evaluated. I will go through each of these um, in, in a bit more detail right now. And my hope is not to lull you to sleep. It, it really is to demonstrate what I believe is very consistent messaging from the statute throughout about what the board is to be looking at and, and how this, this all fits together. So uh, go ahead to the next slide, please. First, we have the board statutory purpose and, and charge. So this is direct language from the statute. It's the intent of the General Assembly to create an independent board to promote the general good of the state by one, improving the health of the population, two, reducing the per capita rate of growth and expenditures for health services in Vermont across all payers while ensuring that access to care and quality of care are not compromised, three, enhancing the patient and healthcare professional experience of care, four, recruiting and retaining high quality healthcare professionals, and five, achieving administrative simplification in healthcare financing and delivery. So that's the overall job of the board. Uh, next slide, please. With that in mind, uh, the board regulates consistent with principles for healthcare reform that are also defined in statute. The board has to execute its charge consistent with those principles, and there are a number of them, but some relevant ones in part are listed here. I'll read them out. One, universal access to high quality, medically necessary health services. Systemic barriers such as cost must not prevent people from accessing necessary care. Two, health costs must be contained. Growth and spending must balance the needs of the population with the ability to pay for it. Three, primary care must be preserved and enhanced. Four, the system must be evaluated to improve quality, safety, access, and cost containment, including efforts to promote healthy lifestyles. And five, unnecessary expenditures must be eliminated. This includes administrative costs that do not contribute to efficient, high-quality services or improve health outcomes. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So with that scaffolding in place, the specific hospital budget review statute lists a number of considerations for the board. And as we go through these, um, you might notice that there are some ways that these items attach to some of these concepts of uh, cost containment and access and quality that are discussed in those previous slides. So specific to hospital budgets, the board considers, and this is not an exhaustive list, uh, Vermont's critical health needs and resources, actual hospital performance with respect to past budgets, utilization info, hospital administrative costs, salaries for hospital leadership, hospital salary spread, and a comparison of median salaries in New England, the extent to which, if any, undercompensated costs are charged to the commercial market, hospitals' investments in workforce, reports from professional review organizations, public comment, and then the benchmarks that are established by this board. If you can go to the next slide, we'll just turn briefly to the benchmarks. So under statute, the board may establish benchmarks. These are a process to define on an annual basis criteria for hospitals to meet. There are a number of examples of what benchmarks can, can look like. And what Elaine is going to do in a moment is turn to those and describe what this year's benchmarks are. The board establishes benchmarks for hospital use in developing and preparing budgets. And in doing so, uh, GMCB staff meet with VAS and meet with the HCA and obtain input. Um, and then benchmarks are provided to hospitals by March 31st. Benchmarks help the board consider whether budget adjustment is necessary. Benchmarks are not the statutory objectives or requirements. So they're a tool, is, is a way to think about them. Uh, and then go ahead, please, to the next and I believe final slide. So if we just kind of break this out as a very simplified overview of, of what's here, the board is tasked with establishing hospital budgets that meet the state's objectives that are described in statute. And these objectives consistently tie back to increasing access, improving quality, and containing cost. There are some other things in there, but those are, those are three pretty big themes throughout the statute as, as far as I can see. 
Each year, the board establishes benchmarks to focus its analysis and to aid discussion with hospitals. It establishes budgets using the objectives in statute. It doesn't establish budgets using, you know, it doesn't establish budgets by just setting them to the benchmarks, but the benchmarks are really useful tools in evaluating what the board should be looking at. Um, each hospital, again, bears the burden of persuading the board that its proposed budget aligns with the state's regulatory objectives. And in the end, that's the thing that the board is is making determinations about. Um, and that's that's it for me. So I'll go ahead and turn it back to you, Elena. Great. Thank you, Mark. All right. Um, so then we'll just do a brief overview of guidance. Um, so just a reminder of where we are in the process. So the hospital fiscal year begins October 1st, but guidance is really issued for that for that year in March. Um, so you guys wait in, kind of explored a variety of metrics um, and established that guidance um, in March of this year. We issued written guidance and hospitals had until July 1st to work that guidance into their budgets um, and consider it before submitting their materials on July 1st. We actually extended that to July 8th this year. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we have to approve, modify, or deny budgets by September 15th um, in order for that October 1 fiscal year to commence. So I just wanted to do a brief reminder of where we are in the process. Um, we, in, in the guidance, established this um, decision tree to help guide how we're thinking about reviewing budgets. Um, so again, as Mark mentioned, these benchmarks are kind of step one. Um, we set three benchmarks this year, which I'll talk about in more detail. Um, if the hospital meets the benchmarks and staff kind of look at the budget assumptions, are they reasonable? Are submissions complete and are they timely? Um, and then, you know, we'll either recommend to approve the budget or consider adjustment. Um, if the benchmarks are not met, um, we still look for budget assumptions to see if they're reasonable and if the budget makes sense to us. Um, and again, are they complete and timely? Um, and then we may dig in a little bit more and ask questions and review hospital justifications, which were required in section one um, in more detail. Um, and we still may you know, determine that the budget may not meet the benchmark, but we may still recommend approving it, or we may consider um, budget adjustment. Um, and then regardless of whether or not the budget is approved, there may be other kind of opportunities for hospitals to be forward thinking about um, what they can do to continue to improve. Um, this isn't kind of a one and done. We're expecting that, you know, change takes time. Um, affordability and improving affordability, quality and access takes time, but we need to kind of understand where hospitals are going and how they're thinking about helping us um, solve these um, real challenges. So this year's hospital budget guidance set three benchmarks, as I mentioned. The first one is the net patient revenue. Um, it capped no more than three and a half percent. This is the total amount of revenue that a hospital receives for delivering patient care. Um, so this is a sum of all um, payers, Medicare, Medicaid, commercial, et cetera, um, that they would receive from, from operations, um, from delivering care to patients. Um, and that is in line with the 3.5% that's set in the Vermont All-Payer Model Agreement, which is essentially our state's total cost of care target um, and what we've committed to do to try to control healthcare spending and get it more in line with economic growth. Um, the second benchmark we set is for commercial rate growth, which um, I'm, you know, I think what I've noticed over the past couple of weeks from working with various hospitals and other folks is that this word rate can sometimes be confusing. The intent here, and as was spelled out in guidance, is really about controlling prices. Um, so we know that commercial prices are often higher in order to kind of subsidize that cost growth um, where other payers may not be keeping up um, or kind of granting the same kind of pricing reimbursement or price increases to accommodate that price growth or that, uh, that cost growth. Um, and so this year we said, you know, we want the commercial price growth to really or reimbursement growth to be no more than um, PCE price index plus 1%. This was a, an inflationary measure um, that was akin to kind of like a CPI, but um, made the most sense and was kind of smooth um, for all um, over time. And so that was 3.4% based on um, the data that we had at the time. Um, 
And then we wanted to make sure that, you know, you met those two things and that you were still achieving a positive operating margin. Uh, we didn't weigh in on exactly what the right operating margin is because it may look different for different hospitals. Um, and so we said it, we just want to see it greater than zero. And there may be good reason to be, um, you know, slightly above or more above that amount. Um, and then hospitals not meeting these benchmarks were required to justify with evidence why they needed more than what we established in guidance. And there were particular requirements <clears throat> for each of these um, where we wanted to see productivity information. Um, how are you maximizing the use of your existing resources? Um, are you kind of bringing in and recognizing all of the revenue that you have opportunity to recognize, et cetera? Um, so we, are you managing costs um, to the best of your ability? Show us how. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that we'll be looking for this year um, from hospitals um, to justify those requests. Um, okay, so I'm going to kind of go through what we have so far. This is going to be high level overview and then, you know, our hospitals will um, each present their own budgets over the course of the next several weeks and then staff will kind of come back and pull to that, you know, pull from what we heard from hospitals as well as kind of dig into their financial metrics in more detail. So, um, you know, there will be more data coming out as we kind of get um, get that up and running, but I'll, I'll kind of revisit that at the end. Um, okay, so and the first thing, so I mentioned that our you know our our um, <clears throat> our deadline for submitting budgets is July first this year. We extended that to July eighth because we got one of the kind of important templates out <clears throat> later than we anticipated, and we wanted to give everyone time to digest that and ask questions. Um, even with this deadline and the extension, two hospitals submitted major updates to their budget after the deadline. Um, you know, one, and I'm not, I'm not, this is not a name and shame. I'm just kind of calling out process because I want everyone to be aware of kind of what the challenges were. Um, and this is still a moving target. We still don't have all the pieces of some of these budget requests. So um, SVMC was unable to um, negotiate a higher Medicare reimbursement rate, so they resubmitted their budget on July 24th. UVM, though they notified us that they um, wanted to request a higher rate um, due to higher than anticipated costs um, with bargaining, um, they resubmitted their budget documents starting on August 2nd, and some of them came in yesterday. So I really did my best to incorporate the latest data I have, but that, I mean, that doesn't really give us much time um, to analyze um, and do kind of a deep dive. So we're really stuck being at high level here, and high then here we'll, and have we'll have to go into more detail. Into more detail. There's, some There's some feedback. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So, um, you know, I think I mentioned this deadline challenge. We're still waiting on some resubmission. So we've been going through and kind of checking and making sure all the materials make sense to us. We're still waiting on a couple items from some hospitals and more from others. Um, and so I think I just wanted to plant this here for kind of future thinking. How can we um, really make this process as seamless as possible so we have the best information um, by July 1st so we can actually kind of spend time looking at it. Um, you know, we're thinking about June office hours templates for budget assumptions. You know, if we recognize that a budget is just a budget, but at some point we have to draw a line in the sand. So if if staff and the board can understand more, what are the assumptions in the budget and how those might change? Um, that might be one way to get around this resubmission of budgets. Um, and then I think proposing to have some kind of mechanism that, you know, if we don't get the information we need or our submissions are not timely or complete, you may just get a level funded budget. It's it's a huge administrative burden to be chasing down all the materials. Anyway, I just wanted to say that it's something we're thinking about, but. Um, you know, it affects the quality of the analysis that we can do. Um, so if I'm going to summarize our the budgets that came in, um, you'll notice, so this is each of the benchmarks, um, the commercial price benchmark, the NPR growth benchmark, and the operating margin benchmark. Um, you'll notice all the way on the right um, looks across all three. None of our hospitals met all three of the benchmarks, um, which means that they're kind of all right for a, a deeper dive. Um, and so <clears throat> what you'll see is that some kind of did better on the commercial price, but then they made up for it um, on the NPR growth. So it could be coming from volume. It could be coming from um, somewhere else. Um, but, you know, those operating margins are generally um, 
close to or meet the guidance with the exception of grace, which we know they get, you know, some donations. And so the, at a total margin, they may look better, but their operating margin may look lower. Um, so I'm, we feel better about the operating margin, but then we really have to dig in to hospital assumptions and make sure that those operating margins seem reasonable and achievable. Um, um, when we looked at kind of the impact of um, these budget requests on the total, you'll see um, the system growth year over year based on the best available information we have at this point of time looks to be about 8%. Um, so we set guidance at 3.5% for NPR growth. Uh, System-wide growth is really about 8%. Um, commercial price growth um, at the system level um, looks, this is kind of the impact um, of the price growth on NPR um, looks lower. Um, so that's, we'll dig into that further. Um, but when you look at the percent of NPR growth driven by commercial price versus non-price, um, you'll see that 33% of that overall NPR growth is driven by price and 66.7% is driven by non-price. So um, predominantly utilization, you'll see that 4.2% in the middle there is really system-wide volume growth assumptions. Um, okay. And this is based on data submitted as of yesterday. Um, so we're still kind of error checking and there are some that look still a little bit um, different than what I would expect. So this may evolve as we learn more um, in the coming weeks. Um, this is looking at price versus non-price components of just the commercial component of NPR. So this is important because this is what translates kind of directly into commercial premium growth. Um, so you'll notice that the system year over year grew in the commercial revenue sector by 9.6%, 5.4% um, from commercial price, 44.2% non-price. So if you look all the way to the right, as a percentage of the commercial NPR growth, 57% of that growth comes from commercial price and 43% of that comes from non-price or volume. So when you're thinking about premium growth, prices are important, but you also need to think about volume growth. So those are kind of two levers um, that um, folks have to, to, increase, um, to increase reimbursements. Um, this was another version of a, a slide that you saw earlier this year. So really thinking about, you know, NPR growth over time um, in 2017, if we took 20, so this is looking at if we took 2017 and applied a three and a half or 4.2% growth factor, where would we be? We're substantially higher <laughs> than where we would have been if we kind of kept to that four. 0.2 or 3.5%. Um, we said 3.5% this year. Even if you give guidance, we're still going to be over that over this period of time because of the more recent kind of um, increases that we've allowed in 23 and 24. Um, so you'll see this bar chart all the way to the right. So that's looking at FY25, the guidance um, versus what was requested. And so um, I think the colors may be swapped there, but the top line is what was requested and like the next line um, is what was established in guidance. So the requests are higher than guidance. Um, I, also for FY24, you'll see um, that the projected is outpaced the budget. And so, um, you know, we're already kind of overshooting here and then we'll get back to enforcement for FY23, but we did have some overages in FY23, which is why we think it's really important to look at these budget to budget when you're thinking about system level growth and then understanding how you get from budget to actuals and trying to have a conversation about when that's warranted or not. And then how do we model growth going forward? So if you look over this period of time, compound annual growth has been around 6%, which is quite a bit higher than the 3.5% that our state has been aiming for for quite some time. Um, so this is looking at, you know, hospital financial health is also very important, um, operating margin and total margin. Um, we included EBITDA margin, which is kind of um, in between. It adds back depreciation, interest, um, um, and other things to kind of get a more of an operating picture. Um, and so you'll see, you know, some of our margins, our operating margins are are quite negative, but then, you know, with total margin, um, 
Things are looking better using our projected data, though our 23 actuals were not so great. Um, but our FY25 submitted budget as in terms of total margin, everyone is expected to be over um, that 0%, which is helpful, but still some concern um, of some that are really hovering around zero that doesn't give a lot of room um, for error. And then if you're relying on investments to kind of get you over the line, that's also tricky. Um, if the market isn't going, doesn't do what, what you expect. So you really wanna make sure that your operating margin is um, solid um, so that you don't have, um, you're not subject to kind of the market conditions. Um, days cash on hand is another area that um, we kind of continue to look at. It's kind of the hospital's ability to meet its obligations and pay its bills. Um, so this is the number of days that you have um, cash and you're able to cover those expenses. Um, if you look at our FY25 submitted budget, it's looking quite a bit worse than where we were in FY21, which was post COVID. There was a lot of extra funding there, perhaps one time funding. And so it's reasonable that we wouldn't be as favorable um, as we were in 21. But um, these are pretty, some of these are pretty troubling, particularly the 44 days cash on hand or 50, uh, almost 56 days cash on hand. That, you know, means that we have just over a month, month and a half, under two months of cash ready to, to cover um, bills. Really under 100 um, is kind of concerning. Um, there's only kind of three months of wiggle room. Um, on the other hand, some of our hospitals like Mount Escutney are doing quite well. Um, NMC, um, Rutland, um, when you're kind of in the 200s, that means you're, you're much better off. Um, age of plant is something we also need to take into consideration. Um, you know, we don't need to have all the fanciest <laughs> equipment, but we want to make sure that our facilities are being maintained and are factored in um, to what we're kind of modeling as expense growth over time. Um, and so tracking that um, in relation. So you'll see, you know, there's quite a bit of variation across hospitals um, with some hospitals kind of staying in more recent years on the lower end of the scale um, or the higher end of the scale. Um, similarly, long-term debt to capitalization is looking at kind of your debt financing strategy. Um, there's, a, again, a lot of variation. So different hospitals have different access to capital and are better able to take advantage um, of certain kinds of um, financing opportunities. Um, operating expense growth. So this is looking at cumulative operating expense growth from 2021 to 2025. So it's like, how much have you grown over that period of time? We're trying to find a way to visualize this for everyone all at once. Um, and what you'll see is that there are a couple of um, hospitals that are kind of at the higher end of the spectrum. So UVMMC, Copley, um, and Grace Cottage have seen quite a bit of growth. Porter Hospital, um, you know, at or above 50% um, operating expense growth over that period of time, um, which is quite substantial. Whereas you have some on the other end that are, are much lower growth um, in terms of their expenses. Um, labor expense growth, you'll see there are quite a few, you know, labor expense is um, a challenge, but some have um, quite a bit higher labor expense growth from 2020 than others. Um, this could be a factor of their size. So there's probably, you know, we'll, as we dig, move forward, we'll look into this a number of ways. Um, but another area we know um, is driving some of the operating expenses. Um, traveler expense, we don't have traveler expense data for all our hospitals. So we're showing you what we received here. Um, this is kind of another area we want to kind of dig into going forward and have better reporting and templates and more consistent reporting so we can understand um, how our reliance on travelers is changing um, over time and where where that's happening. You know, certainly there are a lot of vacancies um, in, and there's probably good reason to have travelers. But I mean, I think as a long term strategy, we certainly don't want to see continued reliance on travelers. Um, it's more expensive um, and oftentimes is not as great for um, kind of patient satisfaction and, and quality. Um, capital expenditures are another area, as I mentioned, that we'll kind of need to monitor um, as a major driver of operating expense growth um, is, you know, how, how much infrastructure you're building and how much equipment you're kind of adding to your um, to your portfolio. Um, so we looked at capital expenditures as a percent of gross operating revenue. Um, but again, we'll dig into that more um, as we move forward. 
pharmaceutical expenditures are another area. So looking at um, kind of variations in, in who's able to manage that as a percent of their gross revenue um, and kind of learning from peers or um, entering some, some of these kind of more collaborative purchasing arrangements may be ways that um, hospitals can move forward and um, look for efficiencies. Um, I'm not going to read this giant table, but just wanted to flag for folks that um, some of the data we collected this year is going to help us kind of understand some inherent assumptions. And this is where you know staff have delivered questions back to hospitals um, to try to understand some of the assumptions in, inherent in their budgets. Um, so, for example, we're you know while the guidance is really about the commercial price growth um, from one from 24 budget to 25 budget. We also want to make sure that you know the assumptions for the other payers make sense and are baked in. So, you know, some have um, a Medicaid inc price in assumption, and I just want to understand, you know, is that med is that from New York? Is that from Vermont? Does this make sense given your patient population? Or if you have um, zero percent growth for Medicare fee for service, why you know why is that? Some of our hospitals are reimbursed based on that PPS growth. Some of them are reimbursed um, based on cost plus. So we just want to make sure that we understand those assumptions. Um, another set of assumptions that are really important is really around volume. Um, so are the assumptions you've baked into your budget on volume reflective of, you know, are they more aspirational or are they more reflective of historical trends? Um, what does that mean? So can we have confidence that the budget you've submitted is achievable? Um, and then payer mix shifts. Um, are the payer mix shifts kind of baked into the budget um, reasonable and do they make sense? You know, there's some here that are, you know, 334% growth in Medicaid. You know, I, I would want to understand that um, and what, what, why that would be baked into the budget like that. Um, so those are things that we'll continue to look at. I'll highlight some next steps and then I'm happy to take questions. Um, so later this morning, we'll hear from Tom Reese and then this afternoon, we'll hear from Rand, um, Bartholomew Nash and uh, Nancy Kane. So, we're together, we're hoping to have a discussion about, you know, different data sets and trying to understand high price, low price, volume, you know, how, what are the ways that we should really think about controlling healthcare spending? What are the tools that we have to ask questions and try to understand um, justifications for higher budget requests? Um, then, you know, starting tomorrow, we'll kick off our first hospital budget hearing. Um, we'll have hospital budget hearings every couple of days over the next several weeks where hospitals will present their budgets and outline their justifications for those requests. Um, and then we'll come back and staff will kind of review what we've heard and um, kind of focus the conversation, analyzing justifications um, and then kind of land on some recommendations. Um, and hopefully we can get to some decisions by September 15th, which is um, our deadline in statute. Um, I did want to highlight that we are working on it. It's live already, so you can go there, but um, we're kind of trying to consolidate all the resources and all the data sets and analysis and reports that you may find useful throughout this process in one single location. So that link on the bottom um, called FY25 Professional and Staff Analyses is where we will be posting that. Um, so there are already some kind of Tableau um, dashboards that use existing data um, that are there just describing kind of patient trends and volume and access and quality, um, but we'll be adding more budget um, specific materials um, and reports there, um, including some of the um, stuff that you'll hear about later today. So that's what I have for you, but I'm happy to answer questions. Um. Thank you, Ms. Berry. Uh, no questions for me. Um, any other board members? Okay, great. Great. Thank you. Um, hearing none, I um, appreciate that very much. Do we, next, we are turning to Mr. Reese, is that right? Yes, and I believe I will share his slides. So if he's here, I can pull those up. Well, why don't we take a quick um, six minute break and transition over. So we'll come back at 10, 12. I need to make a quick phone call and um, we'll resume at 10, 12 with Mr. Reese and we can put up his slides uh, prior to turning to him. So 10, 12, thank you. Um, Mr. Reese, are you here? I am here. 
Hey, good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. I apologize for the background noise, but they're working on the water system up the street. So I hope you can't hear that. No, I can't. Okay, and I see the slides. All right, so we'll go back on the record, um, Maggie. Um, back on so, the record. thank you. So, in my time at the board, one of the things that's really amazed me is the public engagement and participation. Um, every week we have a hearing. There's a large number of people who come, who are just from the public, concerned citizens who um, share worries about the Vermont health care system, and a lot of people participate, sending us public comment every day. Um, last night, we had an incredibly robust turnout for the presentation from Oliver Wyman, and an incredible discussion ensued about some of the challenges and problems. And I find it really incredible how much people care about our health care system and spend their own time voluntarily working to help us make better decisions and to collaborate with us. Um, and one of those people is Tom Reese. Um, so I wanted to introduce Tom Reese. Tom is a care consultant and he's guided a number of companies on uh, hospitals on system improvements. Tom uh, consulted with the Green Mountain Care Board uh, in connection with the fiscal year 24 budgets and did some analysis that the Care Board um, used and presented in connection with the 24 budgets. Um, since then, he's continued on his own voluntarily to commit his time to trying to help understand our healthcare system and identify opportunities for improvement. And today, he will present some of those findings and analysis um, that he's worked up. Um, I will note that uh, Mr. Reese has uh, certain data relating to the University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, UVM does not agree with the entirety of his analysis or findings. Uh, he's met with them and shared this information, and UVM has indicated an intention to collaborate and help um, work through the data and evaluate it and work with Mr. Reese to see if they can uh, further understand the information and come to ground on the findings. Uh, UVM is meeting with Mr. Reese later this week, I believe Thursday or Friday, and we'll continue to work with him to see if they all agree on what the data is. Um, UVM may respond to these um, findings uh, during its hospital budget hearing, which is scheduled for August 28th. The only other thing I would note is that um, healthcare data uh, often needs triangulation. The numbers have a lot of context and explanation that's needed. And as somebody who analyzes and makes decisions based on healthcare data, um, it's really important to look at it all directionally and in context. Um, so with that in mind, I want to turn to Mr. Reese and thank him for his time and commitment to the state. And uh, we look forward to the presentation. Thank you, Chairman Foster. That's uh, very kind of you to, to give me that introduction. And um, as a way to begin, uh, I'd like to place one caveat on, on the data I'm going to bring to the board today. And that caveat is that uh, I'm actually uh, come to you as an individual citizen. Um, I have had the pleasure of some experience in healthcare that is kind of unique, but as a private citizen, I have deep interest and uh, growing concern about the healthcare uh, delivery in the state. But I, I do approach you as a private citizen. I began my analysis of data from the University of Vermont Medical Center probably into late to, or mid 2022. Um, and I used the data set that I have commonly used in my uh, hospital performance improvement practice. Um, um, called from the American Hospital Directory, which is a, a recapitulation of Medicare data. Um, since that time, I've actually developed uh, several dozen views of the of many hosp hospitals in Vermont, compared to hospitals with similar size, similar location. Um, but have spent the most amount of my time looking at the medical center because of its position in our healthcare system. Um, this morning, I'd like to share with all of you uh, one of four views that I've crafted um, based on the end of September data, uh, end of September 2023 data uh, available from two sources. The first source is the American Hospital Directory source. 
but the second is uh, a data set produced by the, the National Academy of State Health Policy, NASHP, that is very robust, very powerful, and um, I think has the great uh, advantage of being accepted by um, state Medicare, Medicaid agencies throughout the country. Um, so one view I'm going to bring to you today is of, uh, of 46 similar academic medical centers in, in the United States. Um, the other views that I have developed um, extend from as few as 12 academic medical centers, which are comparators. Um, the University of Vermont likes to uh, compare themselves to um, to the 44 best U USA hospitals, um, to 30 university hospital university-based academic medical centers that are as close uh, uh, as I can get to the University of Vermont Medical Center. So with that introduction, I'd just like to walk you through this presentation and then leave it open for questions at the end of that. So this morning, I'd like to share with you uh, just briefly a, a profile of the market dominance that we face and the board faces in regulating the state's hospitals I like to to walk through a very detailed comparison of these 46 hospitals compared to the universities. Um, I also prepared a couple of slides uh, justifying managing hospitals to Medicare as a a base financial measurement standard. And then I'd like to finish with uh, running through a couple of hospital examples that I find particularly interesting and germane to me. So could I have the next slide, please. So this is an overview of the, through September 2023, the last 12 months of total expenses by our hospitals in the state of Vermont. Um, there's not, uh, there are, I think three pieces of this that to me were in fact a bit surprising. First, at the bottom, um, the, the two things that the numbers at the bottom that uh, were surprising to me was the, the first time that I have been able to look at a, the total amount of ex dollars expended by Vermont hospitals over a 12 year period of time. And it's close to $4 billion, $3,780,000,000. Million. Um, out of that, 54.5% um, of it, or $2 billion, was spent at the University of Vermont Medical Center. When I first started looking at this data in 2022, that number was $1.5 billion. So, there's a, the growth of that is is pretty spectacular. Um, the one addition that I would make to that is that if you roll together the UVMMC numbers, the Porter numbers, and the Copley numbers, which are entities of the network, the network actually uh, control $2.4 billion worth of that total expenditures and thus represent 65% of the total dollars spent on hospitals in the state. Next slide, please. So, so, so here is the profile of 46 academic medical centers and it's really in four different boxes. One box being how they generated revenue compared to their uh, comparator hospitals what their cost performance is like, what their quality performance is like, and what the reduction opportunity might look like if in fact they managed to two, three different scenarios. One managed to Medicare, the second managed to the group mean of, of these 46 hospitals, and the third being managed to gold, which I will explain uh, when we get to that point. But the, the top box is, in fact, revenue generation 
and it represents to me a, a the singular most poignant uh, example of what's happened um, to the the affordability of healthcare in in Vermont over a period of time. Now these are one these are one set of numbers. These are 2022 NASHB numbers. But the joy of the NASHB database is that it goes back for 10 years so that it has 10 years worth of hospital data for every hospital in the country, whether that's a major medical center all the way down to critical access hospitals. The most important pieces for you are the University of Vermont line, which reflects the losses they have incurred from Medicaid, Medicare and Medicare Advantage um, over the last 12 months, uh, more than that now, but over the last 12 months of this analysis. And its impact, which is covered by commercial operating profit or margin. Um, if, if, if you look at the, the relationship between the, the comparator hospitals and the medical center from a revenue perspective, the medical center generated 5% above average profit. Um, but if you look at adjusting that profit for their volume, and I have used, and most analysts and healthcare data use ad adjusted discharges. Adjusted discharges are basically inpatient discharges adjusted for outpatient volume. So the two pieces are very important in in looking at comparative data. But if you look at the commercial profit per adjusted discharge at the medical center compared to their, their group of 46, it's 46% higher from a commercial perspective and from a total profit perspective it's 55% lower. So the interaction of the, the, the commercial payers with Medicare, Medicaid uh, payers uh, are certainly demonstrated in the profitability of the medical center and uh, the impact on commercial rates. Second piece of this is cost performance which is particularly interesting because it reflects uh, the core of the problem that I believe is above in the commercial insurance. Working through each one of these boxes, cost per adjusted discharge is in fact, uh, the medical center is 15% above its comparator group. Um, if you look at the direct patient care FTEs, it's 15% uh, above the comparator group. If you look at the direct patient care labor cost for adjusted discharge and, the, and thus the direct patient care labor hours per discharge, those numbers seem to be somewhat out of sync in that the direct patient care labor is 20% higher and the, and the hours are only 12% higher. All of this data work that I've been doing is in fact learning from data. That's what I love doing. That's what uh, I've done for many, many years. And sometimes things happen along the way that you don't anticipate happening. And one of those things happened this weekend to me when I actually was working on a data set for Copley Hospital and suddenly, when looking at the boxes of the NASHP data, which are four, doc, four, four basic boxes, one is inpatient services, the second is ancillary services, the third is outpatient services, and then there's a fourth of general services, uh, which is both mainly administration and, and general services. In looking at Copley, I suddenly discovered that out of 30 comparator hospitals, critical access hospitals, they had the highest expenditures in outpatient services of any one of the 
29 hospitals I compared them to. And that they spent $19 million in that 12 month period of time on those outpatient services, which startled me. And I had also two other comparator hospitals in that group that were Vermont hospitals. And those hospitals were also high in that outpatient services bucket. So I went back in and and looked at the data set that I'd been working on. And actually the University of Vermont Medical Center is very, very high in that box. As a matter of fact, um, of the five comparative hospitals I'm gonna talk about in, in a few minutes, it was by far the highest. Um, and when I fractionated that data, what's driving that up is a box called clinical services. And I need to work with the medical center on what is going into that box. Um, because it's a, it basically is a $173 million box that I can't really resolve in my own mind of what, what that is in that particular area. So there's a, in, in that particular box, you have $179 million. If you look at the total operating management cost, labor management costs, which are some, Thirty-three percent above the expected for that particular box. Um, we begin to get a picture of perhaps two areas in which the medical center is far uh, above their comparator group. One being the services, uh, outpatient services, defined as being clinical. And the second is the management administrative services, uh, which are substantially higher than, than expected. That results in a Medicare case cost that's 24% higher than, than their peer costs. And we'll come back to that in the next slide. Um, relative to quality performance, um, the, their Medicare performance score is a little bit above average, and yet I can uh, remember that score being at 30 at one point in time, which is now down to 19. Um, at one, one time, the medical center was a five-star rated institution, and it's now down to a three. Um, their case mix is coming up a little bit, case mix being the, the mix of patients uh, and severity of those patients, um, but it's still 11% below the 46 peers that I've looked at. And their percentage of patients, the Medicare patients that die is, is, continues to be acceptable and, and very competitive. Looking at what this data tells to me, it says to me, the medical center has potentially three opportunities to become more efficient. One is if they manage the Medicare, which um, is, is, as you will see um, within this group, um, if they managed the Medicare, it would have been a $194 million change if they managed to this group mean, it would have been a couple hundred million dollars worth of change. And if they managed to the gold standard, and I use as a gold standard, uh, Geisinger Medical Center in central Pennsylvania, um, an institution that I know very, very well and actually spent some time there um, on their executive team. And they are a very efficient system a rural system, and it, compared to them, uh, the net medical center would have had a $270 million uh, opportunity. So let's move on to the next opportunity, which is talks about managing to Medicare. Aina, can you move to that slide, please? Thank you. 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. This is a profile of the Medicare margins generated or losses generated by all of the hospitals in Vermont in 2021 in accordance with the NASHP data. Um, it's concerning um, because it represents $365 million worth of losses that in fact, are being, in essence, made up on the backs of commercial insurance rates. Um, you can see what each one looks like. Critical access hospitals um, are, are actually on a cost-based basis on Medicare, so they show all those numbers are positive. Um, but they do lose money. Uh, uh, critical access hospitals lost about $21 million in this in 2021, um, with substantial losses uh, from the full-service hospital component. If we summarize that data, go to the next slide, please. Vermont, in essence, has a $350 million opportunity if it, all of its hospitals targeted managing to Medicare reimbursement as an objective. UVM represents almost $254 million worth of that target. Of special note is that of the medical centers, the academic medical centers that I have looked at, and there are a hundred of them, 72% of those academic medical centers actually in the last a period of the last four years, in accordance to the NASHP data set, generate 72% of them at had a year that they either broke even or generated a margin from Medicare. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. So in summary, uh, that concept of managing to Medicare is one that has been the foundation for many, many hospital systems throughout the country. Um, I've spent uh, the last three, four years working within the, the Ascension Health System, the largest Catholic health system in the world. Um, and the objective for all of their, their 140 hospital CEOs is to manage the Medicare. Uh, that's the baseline. That's how you as a, as a CEO with, of one of their hospitals performance is measured on your ability to do that. Um, so it's not a target that's unheard of. It's a target that's realistic. And in fact, um, there is a, a major academic medical center in the country, the Cleveland Clinic, that has hospitals in both Ohio and Florida who are in the process of figuring out how to manage the Medicare because they believe that's an objective of their system um, into the future. So enough said on that. I want to move to these last two slides, which in fact, um, can you go back to the slide before, please? These uh, hospitals, uh, I have chosen to compare the medical center to in finite numbers um, because I know them very well. Um, and as I said, one of them, Geisinger, I actually was employed by um, they are similar uh, academic medical centers. Three of them, Vidant, Geisinger, and Emory are in fact in the, no, excuse me, got two of them, Vidant and Geisinger are in the comparator group for the medical center. They like to compare themselves against the two out of the 12 that they compare themselves to. So they're an important mix. Um, two things uh, that are really critically important. Um, number one, their number of discharges are in fact um, 
substantially higher than the medical centers. Their case mix index, as we knew, is uh, a bit lower. Um, but their their case mix adjusted Medicare costs are 30% above. Um, and when we look at their uh, inpatient, inpatient routine gross salaries um, uh, divided by their adjusted patient days, they are spending 20%, 29% more on adjusted inpatient days than, than their peers. Um, so there's one perspective. The second perspective, and this is one we've talked about before, um, their administrative and general expenses <clears throat> are substantially higher than uh, almost all of the academic medical centers in the country. In fact, I think there are five that are higher than the medical centers <clears throat> on a, uh, a, a adjusted discharge basis. Those so those pure costs are 400% more than these five academic medical centers that I, I, I know very well. Um, and the, similar to that, the ratio of administrative and general services to uh, the inpatient cost services are almost 500, well, a little bit over 500% higher than than this group of five. They're different than the group of, certainly different than the group of 46, but these are five hospitals that I know have worked hard at making themselves very cost efficient um, and have been very successful at that. I also looked at um, the square footage for each one of these institutions to see whether there was some interesting data there. Um, I, I, I think there is an interesting conversation to be had with the bottom line, which is the ratio of general services to patient square footage, to general service square footage to patient square footage, which is uh, much higher for the medical center percentage wise than it is for its peers. So, so that's a, uh, an area of further um, musing from my perspective. This last slide I'd like to share with you, which is the next slide, is uh, is a, a micro analysis of uh, analysis of those numbers, uh, those administrative and general services numbers. But I was uh, really interested in looking at these five hospitals and, in fact, comparing their average salary component with the medical center's component. And I was stunned that there is no difference, in fact, between these five hospitals in, in, the, in any of the buckets. Uh, maybe there's a little labor overhead costs are 4% uh, higher at the medical center, but in es essence, these hospitals are paying their employees about the same um, on average. And so, so there's not a salary difference here. These are in people numbers, and it's the numbers of employees that that are present in the the administrative general services bucket at the medical center, and um, that total general services bucket is uh, basically uh, um, 120 percent plus above their these other five hospitals. The administrative and general services is 400 percent above them. Um, and that represents a, a considerable portion of the general services bucket. And the total patient service salaries are, in fact, uh, substantially lower um, across the entire spectrum of the other five hospitals. 
So, in summary, I guess the, what I'd like to leave you with is the is the following. Um, I think the University of Vermont uh, Health Network represents a regulatory challenge. It is a monopoly. It is comparatively overexpensed, and most specifically, it's overexpensed in at least management and administration, and maybe in outpatient services, depending on how they are bucketing that that and populating that service line of clinical services. This results in in unique pressure on our insurance carriers, our, certainly our commercial insurance carriers, um, and also reflects, in my opinion, the fairly rapid decline in affordability of uh, those commercial insurance premiums. Those pressures have spilled over into other areas of our economic structure. Specifically, they're having a deleterious effect on our school systems and the amount of money spent on school systems to build um, a, a mental health system component that can help solve that problem but also an insurance component that uh, the schools have to pay for their employees' health insurance and retired employees' health insurance. There may be a $300 million opportunity by managing for to Medicare. Um, there seems to be a simple, a substantial opportunity in non-clinical uh, non uh, clinical salaries uh, plus clinical salaries in the outpatient services bucket. And there seems to me to be uh, an endemic problem in the cost of, of those outpatient services that needs to be addressed. Um, thank you for for your time um, and for the privilege of sharing these observations with the board. Um, I would love to answer any questions as best I can and um, go from there. Thank you very much, Mr. Reese. Um, it's an immense amount of work and I really thank you for putting in all this time of your own time uncompensated to do this for us. Um, as we've been hearing in the Act 167 process, the state's healthcare system is um, at a serious tipping point and we need to find opportunities wherever we can to uh, maintain our system and ensure that the system is affordable for Vermonters. Um, something that Dr. Hamry's work has revealed is the importance of managing to Medicare. So this dovetails with that critical component of operating our system and that where we are in commercial prices it's going to be more and more imperative every single year to make sure we actually are managing to Medicare, especially given the demographic challenges that we have in the state and the severe spike in the plus 65 category in Vermont, who is obviously paid by Medicare. So this will be more and more important as that commercial market shrinks in Vermont and we've exhausted commercial opportunity here. Um, so thank you for your time and thank you for working with UVM and meeting with UVM to see if there's areas of alignment or disagreement or to sharpen the focus um, on this data set. And we owe you a huge thank you for doing all of this really just as a concerned citizen who cares very deeply. Thank you for that. And uh, I, I hope that that this data is hopeful. Um, it is it is opportunistic data. It is it, it, it gives us a hope that we can start moving and shifting those expenditures on hospitals out into the community, um, into primary care and and behavioral health components uh, that are could be really really important to us. Um, I had one question, and I probably will have others at another point. But one question I had was on the Medicare star ratings. Yes. Um, I know that UVM was a five star 
uh, rated hospital. And I, I had thought it was now a four star, but your slide had it as a three star. It's a four star now. Correct? No, it's that a four you star are, now. You, it is four star now. It was a three star back when when that piece of data was uh, produced. Yes. Got it. It's okay. correct. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, any other board member questions or comments for Mr. Reese? I have um, just a couple. If I could. Uh, Mr. Reese, thank you. Um, as uh, Chair Foster said for all of your work on this. Um, on one of the early slides, you had um, Medicare and Medicaid losses yes. listed that were um, some over 3,000% um, different from the comparison group. Um, later on, you had administrative and general expenses that were four to 500 times higher than, um, or not times, but four to 500% higher than the comparison group. Um, are those numbers related? And if so, how? Uh, I believe they're related and in, in my professional experience, um, I've had this conversation many times with many CEOs that that the relationship is in fact opportunity to to manage towards Medicare, um, but that opportunity has to be managed carefully, and that opportunity has to be dedication to cost efficiency in your organization I'm in now. I'm and, in now. and a, a formal program at careful management of personnel and uh, staffing. And so it's, I'm, I'm, I think I've, I'm understanding the manage to Medicare. That's managing your the the business of the hospital so that um, there is you break even or there is a small profit um, on Medicare reimbursement level at Medicare reimbursement levels. Um, the what I want to try to understand is um, if administrative and general expenses are much higher at a facility, would that contribute to losses from Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement? Absolutely, yes, without, without, a, without a question. And maybe I didn't uh, explain myself as fully, but um, uh, as a member of teams that went into hospitals and looked at academic, academic medical centers and systems of hospitals, the the first level of evaluation in any diagnostic is to look at opportunity and there is an opportunity if as a consultant there is an opportunity in losses from medicare because you should be able to manage down to medicare or close to medicare um, and that's uh, the first place you would look is in administrative and general salaries to, to start managing down to that level as opposed to looking to clinical services uh, that are core to your to your line of business. So you look for low hanging fruit in in where there's excessive management services. Does that answer that? Yeah, that's helpful. I, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding this point because the the number of the size of the admin and general expense bucket in your later slide is a is something that is controllable. That's those are decisions and choices about who to hire and how much to pay and how many to hire. 
And it, those choices then show up on your spreadsheet as Medicare and Medicaid losses. That loss is then just used to justify higher commercial prices by some healthcare organizations. So the need to demand higher prices from commercial payers, that sense of need to do that, part of that need is the result of choices made within the organization if I'm understanding your data correctly. That is absolutely correct. And um, those are choices made, um, as you said, uh, on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, and they're choices that that can be made as, as, as the Queen of Cleveland Clinic has begun making. Those are choices made not driven by patient services, but driven by administrative decision. So their objective is to get down to manage by Medicare through reorganizing how they run their organization and not clinically, but from an administrative and management perspective. Um, again, thank you very much. That, that um, helps my thinking. Thank you. Any other board member question or comment? Um, we have about five minutes left and I have to run to another meeting at 11. Um, so I'll turn to the healthcare advocate and then we'll have time for public comment. Um, the healthcare advocate. I think Sam is not asking a question. Sam and I are chatting at the same time. So if that's true, um, uh, I, I think I'll just say uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, Tom Reese, uh, appreciate this presentation and um, and in the sort of interests of full transparency, let everyone know that um, Tom, I owe you an email that we need to figure out a time where we can sit down and go into some more detail. Then I think makes sense to ask right here. Um, and um, also to let everyone know that um, the healthcare advocate will also sit down with UVM, have a have a plan to sit down with UVM and understand their perspective on the numbers as well. But again, thank you for your presentation. I think uh, it's it's it, it helps the process. Thank you, Mike. And we can take public comment via the raise the hand function. Pam Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to just put out another view here. I think that that whole issue about the uh, specific cost, the administrative cost at UVM, has got a has got a huge error in it, in the sense that in here in here's what I think it is, and I think it's obvious. UVM is a has a, uh, is a the UVM Health Network is a. Uh, six hospital unit, a integrated system. But what they have done is, and maybe maybe they should change that. But what they have done is, they have put all they have put at least two hundred million dollars, and three hundred more north, almost four hundred uh, four hundred employees. They had that serve that uh, actually deliver services to all of the hospitals in the network in both Vermont and New York. They are loaded in for accounting purposes on entirely on UVM MC. That obviously skews the administrative cost of UVM. And I think it's that is really obvious. And I'm surprised that the staff of the of uh, of the Green Mountain Care Board hasn't been able to pick that up and make it obvious. Thank you. Thank you for that point. I, I recall that being a uh, part of the discussion last year. Um, during the hospital budget process, and certainly something to come to ground to to understand. So thank you for raising it, um, Mr. Chair Vincent Foster, from UVM. I'm sorry, oh. Chair Foster. Um, I'd like to respond to that because we did look at that last year, um, and yeah. if it were true, we should see very high expenses at UVM, as Mr. Davis is suggesting, but savings 
at the affiliate facilities. And we do not see savings in those facilities. Can I respond to that, Mr. Chairman? I don't know if I'm... Um, can, so can I respond I, to I, that? I, I have an 11 and I'd like to have Mr. Vincent have an opportunity to speak. And I don't, we don't need to get into some sort of debate. This will be something that will be brought up in the hospital budget process. And we'll certainly want to make sure we get it right. And we want to understand UVM's perspective. Um, so I apologize. We have a second session this afternoon, but I want to make sure Mr. Vincent has a chance to speak. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a quick comment. So we were, we are looking forward to working with with Tom to better understand uh, the analysis and hopefully learn from uh, learn from each other. Uh, for uh, Member Walsh, just to, to highlight what um, where you can really kind of see this is in the presentation, and and we'll definitely present more of this at the hearing. But if you look at uh, the five organizations that are listed in uh, one of the slides, so Geisinger, Emory, uh, UPMC. If you look at that administrative cost there, you see numbers that are 23 million, 22 million, 39 million. That cost there is supposed to represent what they're spending on HR, IT, legal, uh, uh, executive salaries. Um, that's what that administrative and general salaries number is supposed to represent. And, you know, because of the way that, you know, the uh, these sources pull cost uh, accounting data when you're part of a network um, that isn't pulling in the network um, corporate structure. So there's no way that those organizations are only spending 20 to $30 million on all of those support services. Whereas when you look at that 150 million for, for UVM Medical Center, that is all of the services that are uh, that are provided to support it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vincent. Uh, Mr. Del Treco. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, so appreciate the opportunity to talk. As um, as you've heard me mention on more than one occasion, and I know that you you and I personally have had some of these conversations. I think predictability on this information is important. Um, I don't know the whether this data is right, wrong, indifferent, directionally accurate, um, but I find it um, a little bit maybe dangerous to be presenting information before it's understood, reconciled. Again, I don't know if it's right, wrong, indifferent. And I and I am I ask very very importantly ask that we have appropriate stakeholder engagement. I will not be at this afternoon's meeting because of a conflict. But once again, I ask for stakeholder engagement to look at this information, understand the information if there are actionable things, we should be trying to do better, but I don't know if they're actionable. Um, and and I, I think that should be a goal of ours moving. Great, thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, thank you, Mr. Reese and Ms. Barraby, and for everyone speaking. Um, we have a one o'clock, so we will um, adjourn for now and resume at one o'clock. Thank you.